Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I couldn't resist um, saying yes to an invitation from a, a conference that named itself after a mathematical number, um, phi. So uh, um, I was so intrigued to find out uh, what uh, this conference was about. So um, I'm particularly excited about the theme of the conference because it's really at the heart of a project that I've been involved in uh, for the last few years, which culminated in uh, this uh, book, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Um, uh, now the book is actually about creativity, intelligence, but whether we can replicate this in an artificial way in a machine, uh, uh, whether this is going to be possible. So I'm going to be talking a lot, of, a lot about the impact of technology on these ideas, and um, I'm probably tempting fate, but I'm going to try and use a bit of technology in this talk, which will probably uh, cause it to crash horribly. But um, what I would like to do is to interact a little bit with you at some point during my talk and get some uh, feedback from you about what you're thinking. Um, and in order to do this, I'd like you to take your, usually you get told to put your mobile phones away. But I want you to get your mobile phones out or your computers. And if you have access to the internet, to just put in a browser this particular website. Uh, so it's a presentation tool I've been using, which is quite nice to interact. So it's glsr.it and then forward slash creativity code. Um, this will allow you actually to take the slides away at the end of the talk. Uh, you can send me some questions. I can't promise to answer them. Um, uh, but we'll have some questions at the end of my presentation anyway. Um, so I'm going to be talking about technology and creativity. Um, I think we're very worried at the moment as a society about the impact of this new technology on our lives, that there are many jobs out there that will not be jobs in 10 years' time. Um, driving, being a driver, being an accountant. Uh, many of my mathematicians that I teach in Oxford go on and become accountants, that is not going to be a job in 10 years' time. Uh, very much something that we can be done by, by in, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, but I think there's one thing that we believe is something that artificial intelligence can never get near, and that's creativity. That we believe creativity is somehow an expression of what it means to be uh, human. Um, and actually, my own subject of mathematics, you might think that mathematics surely is going to be one of the first things that a computer is going to be able to do. After all, isn't a computer just implementing mathematics? Um, I think a lot of people think this because uh, they kind of wonder, what is it I do all day in my office in Oxford? And I think a lot of people think that I'm just doing long division to a lot of decimal places. Um, and if that was true, if that's what a mathematician does, then certainly a computer is much better at long division than I am. Um, but that's not what I do. And I actually regard mathematics as a highly creative um, uh, subject. Uh, it involves uh, somehow mathematicians are storytellers. They're storytellers with our characters being numbers and geometries, and we take people on a journey which is an emotional journey, um, which is not just about producing all the true statements about numbers and geometry, that many of them are completely boring. I think many people think that we're constructing a kind of Borges Library of Babel, which has every single possible theorem in this library. But that's not true. We're making choices. There's a lot of creativity involved. So I've always used creativity as my protective shield against uh, the idea that a machine might be able to do my job. Um, but I, when, during the 90s, I actually got quite a lot of people saying, well, surely you must be out of a job now. Because if you remember, the 90s is when a computer first beat the world's best at chess. Garry Kasparov, beaten by deep mind. And there was a, a lot of people used to compare um, doing mathematics to playing a game of chess. That there are lots of logical moves that I make when I do my mathematics, a bit like the moves that a chess piece can make. There's a sort of end game, the end of a proof. Um, uh, but actually, chess was not the game that I compared mathematics to, because chess becomes simpler as you play the game. Pieces get taken off the board. Um, there's a much better game, which I think uh, mirrors what it means to do mathematics, and that's the ancient game of Go. Uh, Chinese game played on a 19 by 19 grid. You put black and white stones down. You try to uh, uh, 
circle your opponent's stones before they circle yours. Um, and this is a game that uh, requires a lot of pattern recognition. You sort of see the stones on the board and you try and have a feel for where to place the next one. There's a lot of intuition, a lot of creativity in playing this game. It's a very rich and complex game as the game goes on. And uh, actually, the kind of intuition and creativity involved in playing this game has meant that traditionally this game is one that computer science has found very difficult to code up and play um, uh, at any particular level at all. And in fact, computer scientists said that it will be centuries before we were able to, to code up playing the game on a machine. Um, and so because I felt that mathematics had a very similar feel to Go, um, I, I was quite encouraged by this, that, well, if it can't play this game, it's never going to be able to do mathematics. Um, actually, if you go to a math department, you won't find chess boards. You will find boards of Go being played. Um, so I got a little bit of a shock a couple of years ago when I realized that there has been a phase change in the way code is behaving. Um, and this happened um, a, a few years ago when a company in London, DeepMind, um, said that they'd managed to develop a piece of code that they believed could play this game at an incredibly high level. And they challenged the world's best, which is Lisa Doll, um, to play this game. Lisa Doll was very dismissive because he'd never seen any code be able to play this game, which is full of creativity and intuition at any level at all. But what a change is the way we are now do, uh, writing code. Because in the past, code would be written in a very top-down manner. You would have to know what to tell the machine to do in order for it to implement it. So if you're going to play a game of Go, you have to be able to understand why you're making moves. But many Go players said, I'm, I'm really not sure why I made that move. It just felt the right move. Um, so how can you code up that feeling, that intuition, um, if you don't know quite why you're making a move? So the change has been that instead of writing code in a top-down manner, code is now being written in a bottom-up way. The code is being written such that it can learn and change and mutate and change parameters in the code as it encounters new environments. As it fails, it learns from its failure. As Beckett said, fail, fail again, fail better. This is what this machine is doing and learning from its failure, which of course is how we learn best. We learn best when we make a mistake. That's how uh, children learn best. We have equipment in here which is very good at updating itself when it encounters something it's um, got wrong and it reparameterizes the neuronal network to get it right next time. So this is how code is being written now, in order to be able to learn from a digital environment. And that's kind of the change. First of all, we have a very rich digital environment for this thing to actually play in. And secondly, we have computer power that it can actually do that learning process. So this piece of code was given many human games to play, uh, to, to analyze, started to pick up a feel for itself for why moves it would sort of pr uh, prioritize certain moves, not quite sure why, but then it would see that those moves were winning. Then it ran out of human games and started making synthetic games. So it started playing itself, and through those games, the versions of itself where it won the game, that version would be kind of uh, prioritized over the version where it lost. To such an extent that by the time that this learning process had finished, DeepMind felt that they had a piece of code that could play at the highest level. And indeed it did. It beat Lee Sedol in this match 4-1 over a match of five matches. It won four games. Lee Sedol won one game. And he now regards that as the most valuable game of his whole career, that he managed to beat this machine. Um, so we're quite used to machines doing things better than humans. That's not such a big surprise, is it? I mean, uh, we've seen go, uh, computers playing chess. Uh, machines can fly, I can't fly. I mean, uh, machines can go faster than I can. Machines do calculations faster. But what I think was really a gear change uh, in this particular story is that I saw something which I believe um, was a creative act made by this piece of code. 
And this happened in the second game of uh, the, comp the match against Lee Sedol. Uh, Lee Sedol had played um, a white stone down on move 36. Um, he was already exhausted by this stage and decided he needed to go to the top of the hotel to have a cigarette break. Um, humans, we still need nicotine in order to stimulate our creativity. Um, the code did not need nicotine. It carried on thinking. Um, and then it asked the human player to place a black stone um, on the fifth row in. I've, I've put a little white circle on it. Interestingly, we still needed humans to pick up the stones and put them on the board because we still find robots, are, you know, that's a very fiddly thing to do. And we've, over evolution, managed to have amazing kind of manual dexterity, which uh, machines are still not good at. But this was an exercise in pure thought. Now, I was watching these obsessively live on YouTube because I realized my life was under threat. If, if this machine was going to be able to play this game, probably my subject was going to be next. And I remember the gasp that happened when, from the commentators when AlphaGo made this move. And they, they all said, wow, made a huge mistake. Because early on in the game, your Go master teaches you that you should not play any further in than the four rows in from the edge. This is where early competition is made for territory, for the very edge of the board and the beginning of creeping into the center. If you play on the fifth row in this early on, it's considered a very weak move. Um, and so the com uh, commentators were very encouraged that Lisa Dole should be able to win the game from this point. Lisa Dole came down from his cigarette break, and you can see the, the double take. He, he, he looks at the stone on this fifth row in and can't believe why this machine has played. He's already seen the machine he plays at a very high level. Um, but he's a little bit more suspicious, and he thinks for a long time before he makes his next move. As um, the game goes on, competition emerges for the, the stones um, growing from the bottom right-hand corner. And it turns out very late on in the game that it's the, um, the player who put down that stone on, game, on move 37 that controlled that whole territory. So that black stone played at move 37 turned out to be incredibly value, valuable. It won AlphaGo this game. But it was considered early on, was this just a mistake? Now, for me, this passes three tests that I think uh, we should uh, be looking for in something that we might call creative. Um, actually, this is something I learned from Margaret Bowden, a cognitive scientist, uh, philosopher, that I was on a committee with at the Royal Society. We were looking at the impact of this new technology on society in the coming years. Um, and she's been thinking for some time about what she calls tin cans uh, might be able to do or not do. Um, and she has quite a nice working definition, since um, I think there are going to be many, many different definitions um, and investigations of this word over the next three days. But here's one to just start with, which I think is quite a useful uh, 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 definition to, to, to use in this particular context. So she regards it as something that should, should be new. Um, well, computers are quite good at generating lots of new things, um, but are they interesting? So here are the two other qualities. It should be surprising to us. It should take us into a new realm to help us to see things in a kind of new way, but to kind of move us emotionally. And it should have some sort of value. Now, of course, surprise and value, new is something we can judge objectively. Surprise and value are much more subjective and would vary from one culture to another, one place to another. Um, but the point is machine learning, if it's given data that we regard as having value and having surprise, then can't it learn from that and produce something that will also uh, make us feel it has value and surprise? Um, so uh, having seen this, so I think this move 37 passes these tests. It was a new sort of move. It surprised the commentators because they all gasped. And in a game, you can judge value very easily because it won AlphaGo that game. Um, and also, the exciting thing is that this move has taught us how to play this game in a completely new way. We thought we'd found the kind of optimal way to play this game. Um, but what AlphaGo has shown us is that although we thought we were at the peak of playing this game, this was only what we call in mathematics a local maximum that in fact there was a kind of fog around us and AlphaGo, this piece of artificial intelligence, has cleared this fog 
and shown us, no, there is a much superior way to play the game. Um, and this is what I think is exciting about this new tool for us, uh, you know, as humans being creative, is that I know that in what I do, I can very get stuck in particular ways of behaving. You know, things that work. And I will just do the same thing over and over again, because it worked last time in my mathematical strategies. Um, and I can actually end up behaving much more like a machine, just repeating behaviors. And what I think is exciting is that the AI can try and help us to break out of those comfort zones and present us new ideas which might help us to stop behaving like machines and become creative again, uh, more creative as humans. Um, so, so this is actually an image which came up a lot in this book um, when I sort of started looking at the impact of um, AI in things outside of the uh, confines of just a simple game like Go. Um, how, where else could it be creative? If it's learning, you see, what I think is exciting about that move, and why I really think we should think about it as something that was created by the code, is that if a human um, had programmed that, uh, actually, they would have programmed the thing never to make that move. Because the Go masters say, you do not play on the fifth row in that early on. The code would have been written explicitly to deny that move. So this move that it came out of that learning process is really a product of the learning of that code and is not coming from the human player, the human coders. So that's why I feel it deserves to be credited to the code's learning process. Okay, maybe the, the code that, that was written to, to be able to allow that code to learn, but that was something genuinely new that appeared out of the code. Um, so I was very interested, okay, if it can do it in that confines of a game, where else can it do it? So the journey of this book, and I want to just show you a few of the stories um, in the time that I've got with you, um, is, well, it, can it be creative in other realms that we regard as very human, like uh, visual arts, music, literature, um, uh, or even my own subject of mathematics? So there's a whole strand about whether I'm going to get put out of a job. Um, in fact, one of the first coders in history, we celebrate Ada Lovelace Day um, every October, actually. Um, she was the first person to realize you could write code to make machines to do more interesting things than just kind of calculations. And she saw Babbage's machine, which was created to do long division, things like that. And she realized, no, you can write instructions to make it do something more interesting. And we now regard her notes as the first example of code that would be implemented to make my machine do what it is now. Um, and she was already speculating in those notes about the potential of machines to do things more interesting. And she wrote, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. Of course, maths and music always had quite a close connection. So the idea of patterns emerging, growing, maybe something a machine would do very well. But she had a word of caution about the role of the machine in this creative act. She said, it is desirable to guard against the possibility of exaggerated ideas that might arise as to the powers of the analytic engine. This was the name of Babbage's machine. It has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we order it to perform. And I think that's been the thought in the past, that code, OK, the machine might do something, but it's us, the humans, who are telling it what to do. So if it starts writing music, the creativity is the creativity of the human coder that wrote the instructions that told the machine to do something. But I think that's what's changed in the last few years because of this new sort of code which is learning and changing and mutating and becoming something completely different from what the human originally wrote. So I think we're starting to see a disconnect between the code and the original human coder. And so you've probably heard of the Turing test, you know, can a computer pass itself off in an interaction online uh, and convince us that it's human? Um, well, there's something called the Lovelace test now. Uh, I think this is kind of interesting in relationship to the themes of this uh, conference. Can a machine originate a creative work of art such that the process is repeatable? So this shouldn't be just a result of some sort of hardware error or the result of some external uh, kind of random input. So the creativity should be embedded in the code. Should it, it should know what it's doing. 
It's interesting because many creatives will use randomness from the outside to help push them in new directions. Leonardo used to do that. He used to throw a rag at the canvas and then just see the kind of uh, um, the, the start of an image beginning to appear, which would take him on a journey. But I want the, um, the creative act to be part of the code or a product of the code. But here's the challenge. The programmer who wrote that original code is unable to explain how the algorithm produces output, such that it, the code, you know, oh, well, I didn't tell it to do that. I don't know why it did that. But um, so the learning process has taken the code into a realm where the coder just doesn't have any control or understanding of it. Um, so here's the challenge. How good is um, uh, AI uh, trying to challenge this idea of um, it still being the human that's producing the thing. Well, I'm going to start with the um, visual realm, actually, because that's where AI has been very successful over the last few years. Um, uh, kind of vision recognition software is extraordinary because of a learning process that is going on. Give Google image uh, recognition software any photo that you've got, it will amazingly tell you what's in that photo. Um, so I'm going to start with the visual realm. And um, here, I'm going to start to, I, I'm going to offer you a challenge, OK? So here are two paintings. One of these is done by a human. And you can probably recognize which human. This is Rembrandt. Um, so Rembrandt has a very particular style of painting, his use of light, um, the way uh, the portrait is kind of set. Um, uh, but one of these is actually done by a piece of machine learning, which has learnt on all the portraits that uh, Rembrandt has made and has learnt that style so much so that it could reproduce something. So I'm going to send these to your mobile devices. Um, hopefully, uh, uh, let's see. Um, so if, if no network at all, okay. Uh, some people are getting um, uh, okay. Uh, I mean, we can go analog. I can I get you to put up your hands as well. Um, uh, but if you have a phone, you could send. Uh, let me just see whether. Uh, so there should be two. Um, uh, is anybody able to send me some information? Okay, well, uh, um, let's see. So there should be some data coming through. Um, okay, so we can. So here, here's the data of what you're thinking, and you can add to the data if you feel that. Um, so let me just tell well, you are somebody's voted and taken it. Um, so let me just explain how this data is working. Um, so uh, pie charts work clockwise. So the red actually corresponds to the image on the left rather counterintuitively. So at the moment, you're going for the image on the left as the artificial one, and the image on the right is only 30% going for that one. Um, I, I did try and write a piece of code to flip these over, but my coding is not good enough that I managed to do that. Um, OK, so uh, interesting. So who voted for the image on the, so there's a bit too much light on this, unfortunately, but who voted for the image on the left as the one being artificial? Um, yes, what, what is feeling artificial about this? The light, you think the, 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 whoever's done this has not got Rembrandt's stuff, part, part light. And who went for the one on the right as artificial? Don't know. Yes, why do you think the one on the right is artificial? What, what's, what? Um, because of the light. Also, also the light. Details, um, not as much detail as the one on the left, maybe. No. Or it's more detail? More detail. Ah, so you think that might be making... Uh, interesting. Okay, so um, let me. Uh, so it is, in fact, the image on the left is the artificial one. But I think the fact that you know you're uh, pretty torn. I mean, what was the the vote in the end? Okay, I mean you were doing pretty well. Obviously, you're all highly uh, artistically sensitive and know. Uh, it was quite hard for me actually to find a Rembrandt that you wouldn't actually know already. Uh, so I, I think it's. A, I don't think it's a particularly great Rembrandt that one, but. Um, um, so um, you might say, well, what's the point of this? Uh, you know, why do we need pastiche? We don't want pastiche. We want AI actually taking us into the new. Um, and in fact, one of my favorite art historians in The Guardian really hated this project. He said, what a horrible, tasteless, insensitive, and soulless travesty of all that is creative in human nature when technology is used for things it never should be used for. Um, uh, but actually, uh, I, Anyone who wears a shirt like that, I don't really trust as an art critic, but there you go. Um, so we want to go into the new. So here's your next challenge. Four of these paintings are done by a human, and four of these paintings are done by artificial intelligence. So again, I'm going to send these to your computer. For some reason, it's only showing me one image there, but hopefully you're seeing on your um, machines two images. And I want you to press on the one you think is artificial. 
Which one do you think is not done by a human? Artificial. artificial. Choose the artificial one. Which is the one that just doesn't feel right? Um, uh, so are you, are you able to show? So let's see again. Um, oh, so that's I, either. Oh, here we go. Yes. Uh, let me see. There are five people who have voted so far. So um, yeah. Was, OK, right. Here we go. So it's sort of. Um, so again, remember, the, the red corresponds to the images on the left. And the yellow corresponds to the images on the right. So, so um, sort of three, two to one image on the left. So again, who, who chose the images on the left as artificial? Yes, what's artificial about the ones on the left? Boring, boring, just it feels a bit boring. Somebody's just put, okay, yes. And uh, what about the images on the right? Who chose the images on the right? Yes, what's the images on the right? Uh, Help feels human. Oh, you think you could copy these? I think these are quite complex. These are kind of uh, interesting. OK, well, um, let's see uh, which one. Uh, so, let's, um, so in fact, you're, you were right. The, these ones, um, images, the images on the right are the artificial ones. And the ones on the, the boring ones are the human ones. <laughs> But it's interesting because these were shown at Basel Art Fair and people were not told that there was any AI involved in this at all and they were asked for their reaction and the four on the right elicited a more emotional response from the viewers than the ones on the left. And when they were told they were done by AI, they all felt incredibly cheated. You know, um, and why do we feel cheated? Because we feel like we want to be connecting to some inner kind of world, somebody else's way of seeing the world, and, and, and you feel cheated by that. And this is why I think, actually, of all the projects visually, um, the following one is perhaps the most interesting. Um, this is the Google image recognition software. And uh, if you give it this image, this is a, uh, I play for a string quartet in London, and um, uh, this is our quartet. Uh, when I gave this to Google, it was able to recognize four people, violins, a viola, and a cello in the hit side here, really amazing. But then Google said, OK, it's good at recognizing, but what's it really seeing? What's it really seeing when, it sh when we show it an image? Um, and this is the challenge, because if code is becoming so complex, learning, changing, we're beginning to be unable to tell how it's doing what it's doing. And this is becoming more and more important as these things are making decisions about our job applications, about um, uh, criminal investigations and things. We need to know why the code is making the decisions. And we're losing control of that because the code is, is going through a learning process and becoming so complex. So we really don't know how it's seeing things. So Google said, well, let's reverse the process. Let's say, um, just dial up any other things that you're seeing inside this picture. Let's see what you're really seeing. So I put this through um, this thing called Deep Dream, um, and, and this is what appeared. Um, so suddenly our first violinist became this kind of jaguar, and the three other strings became a sort of car that's sort of beginning to appear in there. And it helps us to understand the learning process about what it's seeing. And here's a particularly striking example. It was just given a gray background, asked to see what are you seeing inside here, and it started to see dumbbells appearing. But the dumbbells always had arms attached to them. Why? Because it had never been given anything to learn about dumbbells, which were not a strong man or woman holding a dumbbell. It thought a dumbbell was an extension of our anatomy. And so when it started to draw dumbbells, it always put arms and hands on them. So this is giving us the art that it's producing, is allowing us to see the inner world of the code. We're beginning to learn about bad learning. I did an event last year with a woman uh, from MIT Media Lab. Um, she's a roboticist. And she had some robots delivered to her, um, which had some visual recognition software so you could interact with them. But when she went in front of these robots, they didn't, they didn't recognize she was there until she put a white mask on. She is black, and these robots would only respond to white people. And when she lifted up the bonnet to see the code about how it had learned, it understood it had been only ever given pictures of white males to learn on. And so this is really important that we have tools to understand the kind of inner world of the code. 
So she started something called the Algorithmic Justice League, which I think is a great name for an organization. Um, but in a way, this is the point about our creativity. It's about understanding our inner world. Actually, uh, Paul Clay said, you know, it's not about making the visible, it's, about, it's not about reproducing the visible, it's about making things visible. And that's what co the, we need to do with code. Here's Marshall McLuhan, who said, art is our distant early warning system that can always be relied on to tell the old culture, which is all of us, what is beginning to happen to it. So I think that's what's interesting, is that um, actually the, the creative acts of code might help us to understand how the code is actually thinking, which after all, in a, in a way, is what I think, a, a better definition of creativity for me is perhaps um, uh, um, uh, the psychologist, uh, um, uh, I've forgotten his name, but um, uh, his, uh, uh, I, I talk about it a little later on the book. It's a, creativity is about an exploration of our inner worlds, um, and, and that's what we might be able to use it for. Now, I want to make sure we have time for questions. We started a little late. Um, let me just tell you a couple of other stories. What about music? The challenge of Ada Lovelace, um, whether it can make music. I, there's a lot about music in the book, but one of the interesting stories was the role that AI can play in taking us out of our comfort zones again. Here's Bernard Lubat, a, a Parisian um, a jazz pianist who had a piece of AI learning on his style of playing, but the AI, when it started to play back to him, started taking him into new possibilities in his own work. He wrote, the system shows me ideas I could have developed, but it would have taken me years to actually develop. It's years ahead of me, yet everything it plays is unquestionably me. It had learned from his data, but showed him he was on that little peak, and there was a much greater peak that he could play in. So I think that's the interesting thing, that it can help us to see with material that we have, new ways to do things. Um, okay, there's a music story. What about literature? Interestingly, literature, I thought, was where it'd be very successful, because there's so much data there, just to give it the whole of the Bodleian Library to learn on. But actually, it's finding writing quite difficult. It can do small-scale small prose. In fact, I got a piece of AI to write 350 words of this book. Um, there's one story I asked it to tell. Nobody has been able to spot that 350 words. Not even my editor at Fourth Estate, which I find deeply depressing, because it's so crap. It's like, um, uh, you know, why can't you see that it's clearly not written by me? Um, but Beyond 350 words, it's having a challenge. Um, so here's, um, there was a group in America that really loved Harry Potter. And they were a bit disappointed that there were only seven volumes. So they decided to get a piece of AI to write an eighth volume. Um, so there's a lot of data. They gave the AI all of uh, J.K. Rowling's uh, works. It could learn her particular style could learn the themes, the characters, and, um, and it started off pretty well with this eighth volume. So here's the beginning of the eighth volume. Actually, I love the title. It's called Harry Potter and the Portrait of What Looked Like a Large Pile of Ash, which I think is a great name for a book. Um, anyway, it started off pretty well. Magic. It was something that Harry Potter thought was very good. So it's already noticed that magic is a major theme in this book. Put it right up there. Leathery sheets of rain lashed at Harry's ghost as he walked across the grounds towards the castle. Wow, I love, that's a lovely image. Leathery sheets of rain. I don't think I would have come up with that. Quite, quite creative. Um, anyway, from there, it started to lose the plot a little bit. Um, Ron was standing there and doing a kind of frenzied tap dance. He saw Harry and immediately began to eat Hermione's family. Uh, Ron's Ron shirt was just as bad as Ron himself. Um, so this is the trouble, that locally it can produce sentences which make some sense, but it starts to lose context, it starts to lose the plot, basically. Even in that music example, um, with the jazz improviser, for five minutes, it's quite interesting. But after five minutes, it's totally boring, because it doesn't know where it's going. It's locally producing things, but doesn't have any global sense of structure. And I think this is only going to be a useful tool for us at the moment in stimulating our own creativity. It's only going to become really interesting. And I think this is the point um, of creativity. It's about examining our inner worlds. It's our, you know, the hard problem of consciousness is our biggest problem on the scientific books. And creativity is probably our best fMRI scanner for really getting to grips with this. Why do we write a novel? Because we want to try and express our way of seeing 
uh, the world. Examine our own inner feelings and our interaction. We want to share that with somebody else. As um, George Eliot said, the greatest benefit we owe to the artist, whether painter, poet, or novelist, is the extension of our sympathies. Art is the nearest thing to life. It is a mode of amplifying experience and extending our contact with our fellow men beyond the bounds of our personal lot. Now, I believe that there's no a priori reason why this one day will not become conscious. We are just a bunch of atoms put together in an incredible way over a period of evolution, which has meant that we now have some inner world to, we want to explore with our creative acts. I think there's going to be a point where this, I don't know how long it's going to take, maybe it has to go through a, a long period of evolution, or maybe we can fast track it. But at some point, this thing is going to go, iPhone think, therefore iPhone am, and I'm going to have to think, shit, it either knows, learn a bit about Descartes, and it knows how to be funny, or else there is something inside here going on. But its consciousness is going to be very different from our own. And we're going to need tools to be able to examine what that might be like. As Wittgenstein said, if a lion could speak, we're not going to be able to understand it. Its kind of interaction with its environment will be very different. This is going to be way different from a lion. And I think that its creative acts, already they're a very good tool to understand this emerging subconscious of code. But I think ultimately, this will be a very powerful tool, its creativity, for understanding what it might be like to be a piece of artificial intelligence. Thank you. Mm -hmm.